Good morning, man. It is good to be back in an SGA chapel. It has been a while. Good to see you all. I'm excited to be here. I'm also grateful that my mom and my Oma are here, so that's a huge blessing. So yeah, big shout out to them. Um, this morning, um, since it has been a while, I thought it would be appropriate to just start with a recap of what this sermon series has been about, where we have been, um, because the reality is I have been studying these passages and keeping my mind on these things, but you have not been doing the same. So I want to bring us back together and kind of show us where we have begun and where we're headed. So we started off the year with a SGA worship night. I don't know if all of you were there, if you remember this, but it was an incredible time of worship. And the goal was to give the campus a gospel bath. That was kind of the, the purpose of that, was to saturate ourselves in the truths and promises of the gospel and just to reflect upon, man, we used to be this way, but because of the gospel, now we are adopted and redeemed and we serve this faithful God. And that is the ultimate display of God's faithfulness. And then we jumped into 1 Corinthians 15 to unpack that gospel, and it set us up so well with that worship night for that first Friday chapel where we met together and looked at Paul talking about, here's these clear four things of what the gospel is. And let me remind you, brothers, of this thing in which you stand and which you have received and where you are headed, past, present, and future, this gospel that we need to be preaching to ourselves often and regularly, even as Christians. And then... We saw that God's faithfulness compels personal faithfulness in the midst of suffering as we jumped into 2 Timothy. And Paul, in his dying breath, in his last moments, is writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he's saying to him, man, it is worth it. The, the sufferer and the savior and the saying that he is faithful. And so he clinged to these things and, and taught them to Timothy. And then we spent our last time together looking at 1 Corinthians 10 where it says no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. We saw Israel and the church of Corinth relying on these crutches that could not save them, but ultimately we need to cling to the cross. And we had that analogy of clinging to the cross and not jumping into our sin. So all this being said, we've spent a great deal of time looking at God's faithfulness. And this is only a few instances of it. And that is the point of the sermon series, faithfully pursuing a faithful God. But there is a piece of that in the pursuit of that. What does it mean for us to respond to God's faithfulness by being faithful to him? And so this morning, this message is meant to be a hinge point. And it's very specifically chosen for today because this is, this is a difficult week. You know, we're in midterms. We're headed into our first real big break, and one of the benefits of topical preaching is I could plan which message would go here, and this is one that I specifically wanted for this day. Because the reality is, many of us are starting to find this divergence. There are some of us that are digging in our heels and running harder after God than ever before because of this year and the experience and our time in the Word. And then there are others of us who have experienced a season where we have become spiritually dry as we get overwhelmed with the finals and the midterms and all that's happening and we're weighed down by these things and we start to loosen up on our time in the word and our time in community and investing into those things. So this morning I want to give us a reminder and want to challenge us and encourage us to encourage those of us that are running faithfully and to continue to do that in the ways that we are, but also to challenge us as we head into break, how can we keep running as we hit the midpoint of our semester? So this morning we're going to be in Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 3 and as you turn there I want to share with you a story See, I, I have a bunch of stories, and I don't get to share all of them all the time because, honestly, my stories aren't as important as Scripture, but I think this one's helpful, and this is quite possibly my greatest story, so here it goes. Two summers ago, I got to work with an organization called Next Step Ministries. Incredible time and an incredible journey. Uh, was the most affirming thing I ever did. I joined with 10 interns. Together, we united to lead nine mission trips in Joplin, Missouri. We were trained to do this. I was the MC. That was my position. So I spoke and led a mini sermon every night of the whole summer, aside from weaknesses, uh, weaknesses of the weekends. And during the... Um, I had many weaknesses, but anyway, during um, the weekdays, I would also, during the day, teach construction projects that I probably didn't know how to do in the first place to students and pretend that I did, and then we would build houses and those kind of things. And then also, I led worship after um, with this team, and so it was an incredible time, really challenging, so much going on, very little sleep. And honestly, as I said before, it was the most affirming thing I've ever done. The ministry was incredible, but it was also the most challenging thing I've ever done. The hardest week of my life was in the middle of that summer. 
In the middle of that week, I found myself on a phone call with the head people of Next Step Ministries talking through the details and the struggles of our team, dynamics, and some of the sin issues that were going on, and it was a mess, and it was hard, and I was in a really tough place. And so after wrestling through this conversation, I knew I needed to just clear my head, and so I decided to go on a run. Now, I was in Missouri. It's hot at night. I am not a runner. I don't like running. It's just for conditioning, and um, I, it's not an enjoyment I have. Kudos to those cross-country guys that can do it forever. Um, but as I went out and went running, I went out from this church, and this church had planted a neighborhood that was intentional to reach this crime-oriented community. And so there's a lot of stuff that we didn't want any of those kids to get involved into or see or get into danger, so we never let them go out at night, but I decided to go for a run anyway. Didn't tell anyone. So I went for a run. I'm running, and if I'm going to run, like, I, know, I don't like running, but I'm going to actually run if I do it. So I've been running for like 25 minutes at this point, and I'm coming back. There's this last quarter mile to the church. It's up a hill. It's hot. I am tired. I don't run. I'm just sore, and I still don't know why this happened, but all of a sudden, a massive dog comes bolting out of this sketch neighborhood, wooded, like, house that's fallen apart and is just bolting at me, okay? Now, I don't know much about dogs, but I know that when they are barking loudly and running at you, you should not run away from them because that is, they'll chase you, you know? So I, I froze, I stopped, and I was yelling, like, stop, stop, stop! And I was trying to get this thing to slow down because it is big and it wants to eat me. And so I, I'm, <laughs> I'm yelling at, you know, God, stop, stop, and it is coming. It's like, I'm gonna eat your face, man. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> So I don't know why this is, why he's so ticked at me. Either A, you know, he had been abused and neglected and left in this neighborhood and scravenging around. I entered on his territory at the wrong time of night or something. Or, or if this house, there was something sketch going on and someone sent out their dog after me. I don't know. But all I know is there's a dog that can take me down. I think it was a German Shepherd. I didn't, wasn't paying attention to dog breeds. I was just freaking out. And so this dog's coming at me. It's going to just be a not good thing. So I, I, we end up doing this like juke move. Now the dog's behind me. I'm running. Dog's behind me. Now my, I've been running for 25 minutes. I am exhausted, right? Up this hill. This dog has not been doing those things. So it is chasing me. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. And I'm yelling for help. No one's in this neighborhood. You're not supposed to be there at night. And so I'm, I'm like, I'm doomed. What's going to happen? And so I'm trying to ditch through all these things and jump and juke it out. And it's, it's, I'm like, it's going to get me. It's going to bite into my leg. I'm going to fall face plant and we have to wrestle. And it's going to be like, it's me or the dog, you know? And uh, I'm serious. This was such a legit moment. It was terrifying. And so um, I, we're, now I'm like, wait, I have one card left. I've never played this card before. But like this, so I, got, I don't have any other moves left in my book, you know? And so like, well, it's worth a shot. And then otherwise we're going to be wrestling. So I, I, I kid you not, I'm coming. I like curled around on it. I pointed at this dog. And I said, in the name of Jesus, stop. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, hey, hey. I'm serious. All right, so the dog froze, all right? And I froze. And we're both sitting here like, did that just happen? Like, you know? And so me and the dog are kind of looking at each other like, I'm just like, is it over? Like, do I leave now, you know? And so I ended up kind of backing away. The dog's like just confused and... and Ends up taking off after some other car, something that went by, and I'm bolting back to the church, collapse on the ground. They're like, what happened? I'm like, oh, man. You know, you have no idea. And the first thing they said after I told them the story is like, this is going to make a great sermon illustration someday. Okay? So here we are. This is a, how, how <laughs> you know, how, how the turntables, as they say. Um, but what, what I want you to see from this story is that you know, un unlike in my story, the Christian life is not about running from something, but running towards someone, running after something, and that someone is Jesus. And just like my story, there will be things that try to hunt you down and destroy you, sins and weights that will burden you and make it harder to run. But ultimately, we can call upon Jesus and fix our eyes on him as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And that's where we're going to look today in Hebrews 12. So let's dive into this passage together. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sing which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith 
who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you will not grow weary or faint-hearted. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that your word would speak to us today, that it would not just be another chapel that we sit in or another instance of trying to learn from a lecture, but that you would truly let your word go out and as you promised, it would not return void, that it would pierce pierce into joints and marrow and we would leave this place different and changed and wanting to run harder after you. May we do that, empower us to do that this day. In your name we pray, amen. This morning, the main point that I want you guys to get out of the entire message is a command, and is this, run after God and remove anything that is stopping you from running harder. Run after God as hard as you can and remove anything that stops you from running harder. See, I want to put some feet to this phrase, pun intended. Uh, I, I want to show us that running it, it, this, this Christianese phrase that we say all the time, you know, you gotta run harder. Like, what does that mean? Because it is an illustration. It is a word picture that we're being used here. So, so what, is, what does this mean? How can we do that? And so this morning, I'm gonna give you guys four things that runners are, four things that runners do, and we'll kind of look at those together. So the first is this. Runners can be encouraged by those that have gone before them. Runners can be encouraged by those who have gone before them. We see this in the first verse of chapter 12. Therefore, since we have been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, right? So we see there's a therefore connecting us back to a previous context. We are in chapter 12. There are chapters before this. Chapter 11 is the hall of faith is what it's known for. Oftentimes we call it that because there's this list of men and women in the Bible and it unpacks them in this manner of saying, this person, by faith, this person, action. So by faith, Moses, and then what he did that showed that faith, you know, and it goes through all these people, Abraham, and, and we look at these men and women and say, wow, what incredible testimonies they have of living lives of faith. And I think that's what is referring to at the beginning of chapter 12 here, since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Now picture this, these people have run their race. They have made it, they have finished, and they're now with God in heaven, right? And so they, there's this Colosseum almost imagery of them entering the end of the race, funneling into the stadium, and watching all of us run. But more than this, I think, is the other side of this witness word. They're not just witnessing us, but they are a witness to a faithful life, a faithful testimony. They bear witness to that. So we also can look to them and be encouraged by the lives of faith that they lived. We have examples in our own life of of men and women, mentors, you know, pastors, people that are professors here that have spoken into our lives that we could see, man, they're living a life of faith. And so we can look to them and be encouraged by them. But I think an application specifically is, man, we need to study this book, study this word, look for people that had the testimonies, that lived faithful lives, and see what we can learn from them. Secondly, I want to tell you that runners throw off hindrances. Runners throw off hindrances. We see this also in verse 1. It says, let us lay aside these things. Let us, let, and this word, this phrase, lay aside, it can mean other things, and, and it can mean, and it kind of builds into this meaning of casting off. It's very active to, to throw off. It's, it's aggressive. It's not just, you know, I'm going to set this down right beside me and lay this here, but to put it away, to put it up and, and out of sight, and so this word is used in other places in scripture. In Colossians 3 eight, we see it saying, but now you must put them all away, anger and wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Romans 13, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on these things of light. And so this morning I brought a backpack because I think this is a thing that we can all clearly say is a weight that we all carry around, Right? This is something that I hope will be an illustration that as you walk around campus, you're thinking, man, I could be reminded of this chapel, of this message of the weights that are being carried by those around me as I can encourage them and help them in their journey, in their race, but also think about ourselves. You see, these are weights that we carry. And how dumb would it be to put this backpack on and then go run a race? That's not the order of events that should happen, right? I'm not going to take my backpack to a cross-country meeting like, all right, line up, let's go. And I'm like, I'm going to beat you. Like, you know it. You know, like, that's, this is not the way I'm going to go about it. We need to throw off these things. 
It's active, it's aggressive. So what are the things that we need to throw off? There's two listed here, if you look really closely. The first I wanna address is sins. Let's lay aside these weights and sins. So sins is the one I wanna address first. And I think most of us can identify sins in our lives. They're, they're things that we know are wrong, that the Bible speaks to. And as we pursue God more deeply and intently, we will become more aware of his character and the things that he is and the things that define him and want to be like that and see that the things that aren't like that are the sin in our lives that we're not living as. So this is another application in the sense that as we spend time in God's word and in prayer, praying for the things that God is, that we would be like those and throwing off these sins in our lives, but also thinking through how can we have tough love toward each other because sometimes we need to challenge each other. Sometimes we say, man, you're living in sin. And like, it's not good, it's hurting you. You're carrying a weight in your race. What are you doing? And I know I need that too. And this is not a message that I'm sitting up here and saying, I got it all figured out, guys. Like, you know, go live it yourselves. Like, we, I, I need this just as much as anyone. And so this morning, inside this backpack, I have this thing to represent sin that I want to throw off. All right? So people are trying to guess what it is. So I have a, I have a GRE prep book. It should represent sin. So, I, like, we want to throw these. And so we're throwing it aside. That's the first thing. Okay, there's a the second thing, though. This weight. What, is the, what are we talking about in these weights? These encumbrances, these, these bulks and masses, burdens that we carry. What are these things? Because it is distinct from sin. There's an and there being utilized. So I think what he's trying to get at is there are good things and there are neutral things that aren't inherently wrong in themselves, but they can stop us from running harder after God. It may not be a sin specifically, but it might be something that's slowing you down, a weight that is there. And I think these are a lot harder to identify in our lives. These are a lot more challenging to pick out because it's not necessarily wrong in itself. It can be a good thing. So a way that I want to apply this, to think through this, because I don't want to just leave you with, yeah, throw those off too and not know what they are, or how to identify them. I want to give you four questions here to just think through and identify what those could be in your life. So the first is this, what do I spend the majority of my time on? And, and if you think through that, the, what, what am I prioritizing in my time? If I'm spending the most of my time on that, is that thing going to be for God's glory or not? What do I spend the majority of my money on? Question two, we heard a, a sermon from Dr. Kimball in here and, and a few weeks ago talking about our money and how we use that and steward that. I thought it was a great diagnostic question for thinking through what do we prioritize, the things that we spend our money on, that we invest into. Third question, what are the hardest things to give up in your life? If I were to take something away from you that's not wrong or evil in itself and you freak out and you go ballistic and crazy, you're like, how can you do that? Maybe that thing has become an idol in your life. Maybe that thing has become ultimate to you and you've put that in the place of God, even a small respect. And then fourthly, the answers to these questions, the things that we prioritize in different ways with money or time or things that we want to cling on to, are, are these things that are pushing you towards Christ or away from him? Are they helping you run the race? Because if it's not helping you run, why are you carrying it? And I think... Man, if there's something that should be convicting that I've ever read in scripture, that is one. Because I think if we all were serious about that and got serious and said, man, I'm gonna throw off everything today that is preventing me from running harder, good or bad, there would be so many things that we need to strip off as we run and just remove ourselves of these weights and burdens that are clinging so closely. And so as we just think through this, we need to be doing these things. And it, it's a journey. It's a race. We, it, it takes time and effort. So I also have a couple good things in here that I want to throw off. One of these is a box, of, a bag of rocks. Um, so I'm a geology major, if you missed that. So I, I toss that one. I see if he catches it. Oh, yes. Johnny gone, everybody. And then uh, also I got some good things. These are, these are horn corals. All right, so I have some fossilized horn corals. So I also want to lay these aside and not break them as another translation of that word too. So we'll set these aside, toss them off, right? So as we look at this, we have these things, we need to lay them aside and, and that is point number two there. But there's a third thing. As we say, let's run after God as hard as we can to remove anything that's stopping us from doing that. Runners also run with endurance, point three. See, this means that it's not short sprints of doing the right thing. 
It's not saying, man, I'm, I'm going to take off this sin for a little bit, and then I'm going to run, and then I'm going to come back to it, and I'm going to put it back on. That's not what's going on here. I'm not laying it at my feet and kind of like dragging it along with me. It, it, it's a race of endurance. There's a lifelong path before us. And we cannot coast in this way either. The, the imagery in the illustration that Paul is using is not like a river that we jump into and kind of drift through the Christian life. It's not like that at all. And I think a lot of times we do this. You can think about in just chapel alone. How many times have we sat in chapel? I'm guilty of this as well. And we listen to a message. And then after the message, our first conversation is talking about the critical aspects of how we can break down the speaker of like, man, he said this and it wasn't very clear. Man, that illustration, I have no idea what that meant. Like, he didn't really support that in this way. And we start just deconstructing the way the speaker was and then we leave thinking that we took away something good. And uh, man, that is, that is not what running is about. How, how much more often in our conversations should we be talking with each other as we head to lunch thinking, man, like, I don't know what that guy was saying at all. I, I don't know if he was clear or on point. He might have been heretical even. But the word of God was spoken and God says it does not return void. So there's something just by the spoken word of God that I can apply to my life. So let's talk about what we can apply. Because that's the reality of God's word going out. It is that powerful. We have looked at that. And do you not realize how crazy of a blessing it is that we get to even run, that we have the freedom to run in the first place? We take this for granted, we abuse it. We have the audacity to say to God, no, I just wanna walk on your path. I wanna run, I'm just gonna like chill. I'm gonna stay here for a little bit. I'm gonna camp out, maybe take a side track, you know, down this way. I'll, I'll get back to the path. Thinking that God, that his path is, is not the best for us. How rebellious are we when we tarry down this path? And some of you guys and girls may have been putting off endurance in this way. You've been waiting for the right time to start enduring. Maybe you thought, once I make it through midterms, that's when I'm going to start running. Once I get to Cedarville University, that's when I'm going to throw off that sin. Once I get married, I will deal with that sin. And that's not what we're told to hear. And let me tell you that Satan is luring you into a trap because each day that you are not running after God is a day wasted for the kingdom. And that is a reality that we face. We need to be pushing ourselves to study scripture, not pushing it off. And I can, can I be blunt with you? Like, why, why are we putting it off in the first place? What are we doing? Do we think something else is better? Your circumstances do not determine the strength of your pursuit of Christ. I think all too often we, we sit there and we say, man, it's getting so hard, so I'll get to it later. When the reality is, when things start getting hard, that is when we need God the most. And we have it all backwards. There is this path that is before us. It is lifelong. In Psalm 119, 105, we get some imagery about this path, and it says God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Again, going back to this book, we need to study it because what we find is it is a lamp to take the next step for today. It is not a spotlight to show me the whole way of my journey. But as I study God's word and see more of who God is and what his character and his will and plan for my life, as I, I step, I can have confidence in that step today knowing that I'm living a life that is glorifying God and bringing him glory and, and pursuing his kingdom. And I want to encourage you guys too because I know some of us are, are messing up. I know some of us are in sin. I know some of us are struggling to find time to spend in the word with, with finals and the midterms and all that stuff. And I want you to remember back a few sermons ago where we heard this phrase, he's faithful when we are faithless. And this is not some phrase that's meant to be used as an excuse, oh, I can be faithless then because God will be faithful. Now Paul says, no, don't, don't let sin abound in that way. But it's jet fuel for us saying, man, I could get back up every time and he's still faithful to me. So I'm gonna get back up tomorrow. I failed today, I'm gonna get back up tomorrow. We're gonna run we're gonna run after God together and be encouraged in this. And fourthly, this last point is that runners have Christ as the ultimate example. We see this in verse two of this passage, specifically and in verse three as well. It says, you know, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, the founder of faith. We have him as our example. And when we look back, you know, we just came off the heels of chapter 11. 
in verse 39, which is right before chapter 12. It says, and, and all these things, and all these, though commended, talking about these people, though commended for their faith, they did not receive what was promised. In verse 13 of that chapter as well, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. What was going on there? They didn't see the promise. They didn't get to see it come. Jesus Christ had not been there yet. And they were running with the pursuit of the promise. But the reality is, we have Christ who's already come. And he has pioneered and set the example for us already. And more than that, we have his spirit that he left behind to live inside us. The God of the universe is inside us if we are believers, enabling us to run on this journey, convicting us when we are not. So we see that he is the founder, the pioneer and champion of our faith. And he's the perfecter of that. He completed this task. It is accomplished. He, he paid for it on the cross. It is done. It is finished. And he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And this is incredible. So the question is for us then, you know, where are you fixing your eyes? Are you fixing them on some dream, on some job? Are you, are you fixing them on a relationship or on a sin? I think habitual sin is a thing that we need to think about as we head into a break because I know I've, I've lived in the dorms. You know, I, I, I did that thing. I'm a student, right? I, I served as a CLC in law. I got to see ministry from the inside of a dorm. And I know what it means to come back from a break and have a guy say, man, I left the Christian community and the accountability of these bros. I went back. I got back into a crowd of friends that maybe aren't the best. And man, I, I fell back into old habits of sin, I don't know what to do. I'm stuck. There's this habitual sin in my life. And maybe that's just you here. And you're like, man, I'm wrestling with sin at Cedarville with this community, with this accountability. So what is it going to take to fix your eyes on Christ? What would you give up for him? Sufferer of pornography. This is destroying you. Would you throw it all away for Jesus? Would you throw away your phone or your laptop if that's what it took? Would you place your eyes on scripture before bed and, and when you woke up in the morning and when you were lonely and see that Christ is so much more satisfying and that is where ultimate joy comes from and there's freedom and an everlasting friendship that will reign for eternity that is there. And if not, do you really believe that Christ is better? That he's better than your sin? friend who is wrestling with comparison and low self-esteem? What would it take for you to see and believe that you are made in the image of God? That God has a plan for you for your future in the way that he made you, the way that he structured you to be you, to do a task that he has set before you? What if it took giving up social media and replacing it with spending time in the Word. Because when you spend time on social media, you just see other people's lives and you get down on yourself and comparing and saying, man, I'm not going as many trips as them. I'm not wearing the same clothes as them. I'm, I'm not whatever that they are. When, when in reality, God wants to look at you in a specific way in the way that he made you to be. Do you really believe that Christ's view of you is better than your view of you? That the way other people look at you, that, that ultimately Christ's view of you matters so much more. Friend who is struggling with pride, are you willing to give up your time and money to invest it into service to Christ? Are you willing to serve in the background where no one will see you or notice you or give you credit so that God receives all of the glory? Are you willing to serve humbly and follow the example of Christ as the ultimate humble servant that we see in Philippians 2? And if not, do you really think that God is greater than yourself? Are you putting yourself above God? That, he's, that he, ultimately it is better to be a servant at the feet of Christ than it is to be a king on this planet. That the riches and status of this earth are fleeting and empty, but the pursuit of the footsteps of Christ to earn a crown to throw back at his feet when we reach heaven one day is so much better. Friend living in fear and worry and anxiety, would you be willing to give up your dreams? Would you be willing to throw away your ambitions and aspirations and, and the thoughts that you have of things that you will pursue to pursue the very thing that God has made you to do to pursue? What if he, what if he called you to mission tomorrow? Would you go? Or, or the next day to be a garbage man? Would you do it? If, if the thing that in your mind maybe, maybe is not what you want to be doing, 
And, and if, that, if, if you can't give that over to God, do you, re- believe, do you really believe that your faithful father has a better plan for you than any plan you could ever plan? And that the gifts he wants to give you in the timing he wants to give them to you are so much better. Uh, I also want to point out, though, that we have Christ as our example, as an endurer of opposition. Because the reality is God's plan is so much better because he is faithful and we can trust him. And he endured this opposition. We see this in verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. And right before that, at the end of verse 2, it says, For the joy that was set before me endured the cross, despising the shame, and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What, what empowered him to do this, to endure these things, to go to the cross for people that were killing him, to take on the full wrath of God for someone that would murder him. Why would he do that? It says because there was joy that was set before him. How could there be joy in that? Because the reality is Jesus knew and saw and embraced that the will of the Father and pursuing the Father's plan above all else is where ultimate joy is found. There's joy in the Father himself and that the eternal way of glory that's coming is so much greater than anything that could ever happen to us on this earth. And so we see in James 1, 2, whenever you face trials of many kinds, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. And this is hard. This is one of my favorite verses. And I love it because it is difficult. It's comforting to consider, though, that he endured so much. But why is it comforting? It says it is. Consider him who endured so much opposition so that you may not grow faint-hearted or give up. It's because that when we see that we can endure by finding joy in him, that's where we see our satisfaction rest in. We can endure by finding joy in Christ himself, this example that has gone before us. What greater joy is there than pursuing Christ? Name one, I dare you. And if you name one, it's wrong. If it's not Christ. And that's what the book of Hebrews is ultimately getting at. Jesus is better. He's the better king. He's the better high priest. He's the better new covenant. He's better than it all. That is where true joy and satisfaction is found. And he never grows weary. His presence will never leave those who are in Christ. Isaiah 40 says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains on scales and the hills on a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord and what man can show him counsel? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary, even when youths grow weary. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength, mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. So as we head into break with that comforting Father, that powerful God as our example and our joy and satisfaction, run. Do not let this season stop you or prevent you or any weight that is there. Throw it off. Run harder. Don't relapse into sins or stick that backpack back on. Follow Christ's example and do whatever it takes to need him and know him more. And study his word, spend time in prayer, dig deeply into who he is. Run after God and remove anything that stops you from running harder. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word and the challenges that are in here, the commands that are in this passage. May we follow them. May we dig our teeth into them as we seek to see that you are so much more satisfying than anything else. May we throw off anything that's stopping us from doing the same. It is in your name we pray. Amen.